when we coach people, okay, we're not coaching the death, we're not coaching the grief. What we're doing is coaching their thinking and their processing and enabling and empowering them to process in a way that supports them and serves them as opposed to um, disconnects them or disables them. Hello everyone, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you're all joining in from. I'm Kiva from Kocharya and really, really happy to have you all here today. Uh, we have two very special guests with us today. We have Dr. Colleen with us and we have Tracy with us. Oh, hello. <laughs> So we'll, we'll wait for everyone to join in. We have Matteo, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, from Italy, welcome. Everyone, please feel free to use the chat box to type in where you're joining in from. Hello, hello everyone. Wow, people from different places. Tracy, Dr. Colleen, <laughs> wonderful. Amazing. Wow. Great, great. Hello, hello everyone. We have Yamini as well with us. Uh, she's from Kocharya. She's the moderator for today's chat box and wonderful. We have a lot of participants coming in. Great. So, how are you feeling, Tracy? How are you, Dr. Colleen? Good. It's tired. Tired. It's later in the evening here with the, for me. Early in the morning for you, Tracy, I think. Yeah, not too bad. I'm, I'm currently in Toronto, so the time zone difference is a little friendlier here. But, uh, yeah, I'm excited to be here as well. Wonderful. Everybody in different time zones, we still have participants trickling in. So welcome again, everyone. Uh, before we begin our webinar today, which is on grief, uh, on how we can approach grief through a coaching lens. Um, we have two very, very special people, like I said, Dr. Colleen with us and Tracy, and I'd like to introduce them to you all, though I think you've all seen them uh, here with us at Kocharya on, on different occasions. Uh, but but I'll take this opportunity to also introduce you. So we have uh, Dr. Colleen, who's, who's got a background in psychology and brain-based learning. She is an MCC coach, and she's also got a PhD in mindfulness and leadership. Wonderful. <laughs> and we have Tracy with us, who I also work with very closely in Kocharya. And Tracy is an ICF and EMCC credentialed coach. Uh, she has about 200 hours of uh, meditation training, teacher training with, the lab, uh, with uh, the lab of meditation. And she's also going through somatic experiencing training. So very, very, very interesting uh, backgrounds. And I'm sure a lot of, lot of different thoughts coming in from both of you. So I think we'd just love to begin by hearing from you, from you both on uh, what, what grief means to you. You know, what, how, if you had to tell a person what grief really looks like or feels like or what grief is, you know, how, how would you go about it? Um, okay, Trace, I'll start. Um, I think, you know, well, I'd really start by saying it's kind of, um, it's not really optional because if you love, you will grieve. And that's um, essentially grief is a response to loss. Um, people often sort of um, minimize it by saying it's around um, death, but it's actually about loss in general. And that can be, um, it can be certainly death, bereavement. Um, it can be the loss of hopes and dreams. It can be the loss of a job. It can be the loss of... Uh, it can be divorce, it can be experiencing infertility, 
the loss of the knowledge that you're going to have a child. It can be the loss of a pet. So it really is a painful um, and traumatic response to loss. I would say just to conceptualize it briefly. Tracy, would you like to add uh, something? Yeah, I love what you said um, just now around if you're going to love, you're going to grieve. And I think that's so true. It's like we're um, any sort of like like loss that we experience, whether it's the death of a loved one, the death of a pet. But like you said as well, Colleen, like the the mm -hmm. idea of a future even that has changed can create grief. So it's not even a loss of um, an actual mm -hmm. tangible item. It's a loss of, like you said, hopes and dreams. And mm -hmm. I think that like one of the things that I'm kind of coming to terms with in my own life um, is that we have a sense of, well, there's a couple of things. We have this idea, many of us, I know I did, that grief is something we need to get over, kind of get through. And I'm realizing that it's it's not like that. It's a, it's a part of the fabric of our lives. And there's certain things that I know that I'll continue to feel a level of pain around. Um, and it's the and we'll talk a little bit more around that, but it's kind of the being open to that pain as opposed to shutting it out that, mm. um, that I'm learning over the years. And the other thing that I'm starting to realize having just turned 51, or sorry, having not just turned, I'll be, it was in January, but kind of <laughs> being in this, you know, past the 50 year mark is that I'm also becoming a lot more aware of my own mortality like I never have before. And that's okay. bringing up, some some grief around that um which is really interesting so that's my uh yeah that's kind of what's what's coming up for me right now and I love when you say uh, we don't get through it and I would always say we move through it mm. Mm. so there's not a destination at the other side on the other side yeah also, I think just like how it's actually a fabric, you know, of life, didn't really look at it from that perspective, you know, more as it's a phase and it should end versus, you know, probably embracing it. So I think for our participants, uh, many of you must have joined us uh, 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 in the first webinar of the month where we actually touched upon grief through, through a ther therapy lens uh, mm -hmm. and how uh, grief can be supported through through therapeutic techniques. And I think today it would be really, really interesting to hear from Dr. Colleen and from Tracy on how, how as coaches, they've seen probably grief show up uh, for their clients. And, and how do we how do we navigate that as coaches? You know, what are things that we can think about as as that can help us to get, you know, a step closer towards supporting them? And, and would it be useful? Um for us to distinguish between what is the difference between coaching through grief or therapeutic grief work? Would that be useful as a starting point? Absolutely. Okay, because I think it's really, really important. And I think just firstly to almost, um, to integrate the two is the ICF do recognize that therapy is uh, extremely close to coaching. And there used to be much more of a separation between and 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 there was a bit of anxiety about making clean separations, um, but there are uh, coaches can work with grief, coaches can work with trauma, and therapists work with grief and and therapists work with trauma. However, there are fundamental differences that uh, we need to take cognizance of as coaches. For example, in a therapeutic grief process, the the therapist is the expert. In a coaching um, grief process, the client is the expert. So we're really honoring coaching principles there. Um, in a therapy uh, session, they have a treatment plan. The expert, which is a therapist, will prescribe a treatment plan, um, things that the person needs to do. And it also is more of a process of looking back so that we can be present. Coaching is, there's no treatment plan prescribed. The client evolves their own 
process of moving forward and it is a process of moving forward. So there's times for coaching when the client is ready and desiring to get on their feet and to move forward. And there's a time for therapy when the client, because because when you when somebody is in the midst, midst of deep bereavement, the last thing you want to say is let's find meaning and purpose. You know, let's move move forward. They want to be part of the. They want. They need to be present with the grief experience. It's a more inward looking process. Um, I would believe that therapy with therapy and coaching would be a more forward looking process. Doesn't mean to say we want to separate the two, but we do need to understand as coaches what is our role because the ICF also do expect us to refer if necessary. Thank you, Dr. Colleen. Thank you for actually sharing that. I think uh, because, like you said, there is a thin line, and it's mm. very, very important as coaches for us to be able to identify uh, what role we need to play at that point. You no, know? so. That brings me to my next question, which is on, so how do you identify that this, this is this, what this client is probably going through is grief, you know, because it could be temporary sadness, it could just be, you know, something that's triggered by something that's happening in the moment in the client's life. So how do you differentiate between the two? Sure. Trace, do you want to give that a go first? <laughs> sure. Um... Yeah, so I guess for me, and I'm I'm by no means um, I haven't like focused my practice on on coaching people going through, moving through grief, but it definitely has shown up. So it's shown up in different ways. Um, I've had I've been coaching clients on other things, um, and they've lost a loved one. So then you know that comes up within the within the sessions. Um, it's also shown up with things coming up as people are, you know, their, their awareness is expanding and mm -hmm. all of a sudden they're start sharing about like the sadness that no, no longer having a particular person in their lives or no longer, like, I think somebody over here said identity that comes up a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, I guess where I would, and, and, you know, I love the fact that you made such a good distinction there, Colleen, because I think that for me, were I to be coaching a client that felt like they really needed to go and have a lot of conversations around this traumatic event that happened in their lives, that would be like a clear cut thing of, <laughs> of, I know that I, you know, at this point I would, I would talk to them about referring them. Um, but there are times that these like intense emotions will show up in our coaching mm -hmm. sessions. Mm -hmm. And then we have to know how to hold the space for them. We can't be afraid of that either. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that, that way, that was where, where they would be so similar is coaching and therapy is both creating a safe and compassionate space. It's about empowering because therapy is also empowering. It's empowering um, the person to, to navigate that space. And it's about, how do we create that trust and safety? How do we create listen? How do we listen? And how are we present with the client's whole experience? Because remember, grief is not just an experience of, of feelings or emotions. It's an experience of your whole physiology, of your endocrine system, your immune system, your belief system, your so you're doing somatic um, work. I mean, it's it's such a it's such a profound whole experience. And I would also comment on that on Cynthia's point there about identity. Grief is a shift in identity. So yes, it can be my identity shifted, but grief creates, if, if you have just, um, I don't know, had um, experienced cancer, for example, your identity as a, a cancer survivor, for example, the, that shift of loss of, I wasn't a cancer survivor, now I am a cancer survivor, or I wasn't a victim of crime, and now I am a victim of crime. Um, so I think that identity aspect is absolutely essential. And I think we can really hold that space to help a person recreate and discover and center into that new identity in an empowered way. Um, so often it's just more of um, discovery and experiencing and feeling in a therapeutic session. And it's more about empowering and, and getting people to look outward and forward in a, in a coaching session. Mm. At, at, at what 
point do you think a coach would say that i've tried a lot of things but it looks like uh, mm. the client requires some other support you know maybe therapy like how how would we know as coaches I definitely, Tracy, I know you'll agree with me completely, is that trust your intuition. And if also if you don't feel that you are, um, are can hold the space for the clients, and there's lots of coaches who aren't comfortable in that kind of intense, because um, grief often is intense, not always, but it can be intense, that space. So certainly you use your intuition, and if you feel like it's not a space that you can manage, but in terms of grief per grief is a process there's a time the client do you want to talk about it do you want to be present do you want to um, focus on how do you move forward where do you go from here and um, getting the client also to you know design their own relationship but then I think there's also specific times there's um, one of the key things we need to look out for is um, kind of and I hate the word but it's like a maladaptive grief process which is where um, the grief is complicated you know, there's, there, there's sometimes there's, there's a lot of guilt, there's a lot of um, historical, familial belief conditioning kind of processing that is just um, too, too almost toxifying the, 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 the ease. I, I, I hate using all these words because none of them really belong to grief. Um, if the client is cycling, they're going back, they keep going back. There's no result and not able to move forward. Um, and if they are stuck in the grief process and or regressing, then any of those kind of maladaptive, again, I don't really like the word, then um, I would definitely refer because I'd say there's, there's much deeper therapeutic work that needs to be, um, to be done there. I'd love you to hear your perspective on this, Colleen, because I was reflecting on this earlier and the role that coaching could play in hand with therapy as someone's going through bereavement. And I was thinking um, about my own past experiences and as well as others that I know that have gone through the loss of a loved one that's close to them. And there's so many decisions that need to be made that yeah. I feel like a coach could really be like if I had had a coach yeah. at that point in time <laughs> it would have just been life-changing for me you know and so I you know I, I wanted to, to get your perspective on how that could kind of align with at the time I probably would have also needed a therapist you know but having the two in terms of being able to kind of know what's to deal with what was happening what had happened already but also to like yeah. navigate what was coming next mm -hmm. and there's all this like I don't know if there would be another role or, and I believe a coach could, could fulfill that role. And I'm just, um, I know one of the coaches I trained actually became a, um, she didn't call herself a grief coach, but she would, she would actually go to families who were preparing for a grief process, you know, kind of somebody was dying in the process of, in the end of life stages. And she would also help, help na them navigate, not only from a, emotional psychological but also from a practical point of view you know what can you actually do what how how do you speak to the dying person how do you prepare for a funeral and have these conversations I remember when my my father passed I couldn't I couldn't talk to him about his funeral and it was crazy because I wanted to give him the funeral that he he wanted but I didn't know how to have that conversation part of my culture is you don't talk about these things so I think there's a role for even if, if for courageous people to be able to sit in that space and and do family sort of um, processing as well. I'm not sure if that's what you were saying, Tracy, but it just sort of triggered a thought there for me. Absolutely, you know that that reminds me of, um, I, I, you know, a, a very close friend of mine died and and we knew that she you know she she was she had cancer and it was a matter of time and I was in such denial around it mm -hmm. and kept thinking I know I want to have these conversations with her but I'll I'll do it when you know and yeah. looking back I know that that was avoidance and so had I yeah had someone to help me navigate like how do we because I was afraid of having the conversation because then that would mean kind of admitting that that we were going to say goodbye to each other. Yeah. And yeah. Literally. Tough conversations. And and not everybody wants to or feels it. 
feels that 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 it's it's not a space everybody wants to enter. But if if a person is aware that there's somebody that can facilitate those kind of conversations for you, um, or you can and you can you can read books on how to have those kind of um, difficult conversations, whether it's with children, whether it's with adults. Um, yeah, I think there's there's so many sort of roles that we can play, but I always think that we have to honor our role as coaches, which is about is about empowerment, and also remember. Um, it's just popped into my head now but one of the things we're doing is when we coach people okay we're not coaching the death we're not coaching the grief what we're doing is coaching their thinking and their processing and enabling and empowering them to process in a way that supports them and serves them as opposed to um, disconnects them or disables them so um, I don't think we've got to be the expert on the death or on death itself or loss itself, okay, because we said there's many different aspects to grief. But we need to be the expert on a person's processing, which absolutely includes a person's emotion, emotions. And a lot of people are so overwhelmed by somebody else's emotions. That's what we do when we're with people. We don't want to talk about it. You know, you know what people say, it'll, it'll, um, it'll take a year, you know, um, it's my, my worst comment imaginable. Um, David Kessler, one of my favorite um, grief uh, speakers on grief, he always says, death is not a condolence. It's an aspect of, of grief. Or people say, you'll feel better, or they've gone to a better place. You know, the, all of these comments that people make, because we don't know what to say. And I think as coaches, what we really need to grow and build is the muscle within ourselves is probably the wrong word muscle but the ability to stay present with grief with pain with sadness to be present with the client like you said Tracy sometimes it comes in the middle of a session it's not really maybe it's two years after I mean my brother passed away 28 years ago and sometimes I get overwhelmed by grief about that because we're talking about something that is connected to whatever um and if a, if a coach can't sit present with that pain and tries to deny it or avoid it, I don't think we're in service of the client. So yes, we're not therapists, but we also need to be able to manage ourselves and to not feel like we've got to change the client's emotional experience. A lot of new coaches, I find, Tracy, want to change their experience to be happy. You know, that's not our role, but it's to empower them and help them think and, and, and move through. Yeah, because if we're trying to change their experience, then we're not accepting the experience as it is. And then how can we hold a space for them to be in acceptance? Yeah. The acceptance has to start with us allowing, like whatever shows up is there. <laughs> and we have to, and we hold that, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and having said that, there are a few, like, as you, as you, I, I'm sure as well are very familiar. There's a few tools that you can use if somebody is really like, really a lot of traumas coming up for them and we, we want to sort of help them resource, but that's different mm -hmm. from trying to yes. change their experience. <laughs> exactly. Absolutely. But I think that's very important is help them be resourceful. And we're not counselors and a counselor or a social worker or a therapist would, um, would say do this and this is how you manage grief you do this and you do this and you do this and you do this but I don't I think it actually is useful for us to know things like if the client is having recurring flashbacks for example okay maybe that's what's well, a trauma and a grief response to be able to say to them that is normal um if a client is not sleeping to encourage them to maybe go to their general practitioner to get support for sleep just while they navigate this difficult process so that they can um they can navigate it you know so I don't think it's 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 out of our it's not an, it's although we're not telling people what to do i think we can understand what are some useful resources that they can access whether they're internal resources or practical resources as well i think yeah. uh, as as you were sharing uh, dr colleen and tracy uh, i was getting reminded of uh, the first session that we'd had on this uh, with with the two therapists and i remember um, they had shared something around uh, how grief actually shows up in different ways and it actually takes like 
you know, different layers uh, till you actually dig deeper into reaching that core, which is, yes, this is grief. And then from there, the stage of accepting it starts for the client. So in coaching, like how would, how would we go about it? How would we navigate these different stages that probably show up? Uh, are there, like, like yeah, how would, how would you go about it? I am a great fan of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. I think it might have been mentioned in that um, original webinar. Um, and I'm a great fan of her, hers because I think to a large extent people misunderstand. Although she was working with people going through the end stages of life, um, she wasn't saying it's only the process of the dying. It's the process of death and dying and acceptance and moving through it. And she also, what is very important, people think that there's a certain, so what are the st stages? You go through, you go for, to immobilization, you go through um, denial, you go through anger, you go through depression, and they say ultimately acceptance, okay? That is supposed to be the final part of it. But Elizabeth Kubler-Ross herself said, it was not a linear process, it's, it's a it's it's a process that you go in of in and out and and back and forward um, and like I said you can't say time generally speaking as a rule of thumb but I don't even like to say rule of thumbs we're looking at about a year and then two years that's what I always say it's going to take a year and then it's going to take two years um, it's going to take another year um, and then we really the person is not moving into a kind of maladaptive degree process they start to be able to see a future they start to be able to center in a new identity separate to the loss whatever the loss is um so those stages of grief are it's any emotion it's uh, people sometimes are they feel they feel joyful and excited and then they feel guilt and how can i how can i say this how can i do people get hysterical people get um neutral and uh, numb you know there's i mean there's absolutely every on the spectrum of emotions I don't think there's any time when you actually experience a broader spectrum of different emotions. But again, it's that conversation that we have about, about grief that, oh no, you shouldn't be doing this. We shouldn't be doing that. And people, a person feels guilty. Don't be guilty. Don't be sad, you know? Um, so I just think actually as coaches, we really and truly need to be learn to be present with strong emotions and not overwhelmed by them. And I'm seeing there's a, a comment about um, Tierly very important comments about um, we've got to be able to to pick up, to be present, to say, you know what, this person actually needs something a little bit more than I can give them, but also still to be em empathic. And just remember, be careful of empathy because empathy, we have, as coaches, we have empathy burnouts. We get toxic empathy where we want to rescue because we're feeling these emotions. All the, I'm a grief coach and a trauma coach. So, boy, you, you see stuff. And if I had to take it on me, I would be burnt out completely. But we need to be able to be present with that emotion, um, whatever it may be, um, wherever on the spectrum that emotion is, but it's, and, and be present with it, but not take it on. It's not my emotion to feel. But if, if, if um, Kira, you are sad, I will feel a sense of sadness because um, I, I have empathy, but more than empathy, I have compassion. And that compassion allows you to hold your pain. And I'm there to support you to navigate it, not to rescue you, not to take it on and not to overwhelm you with my feelings. But this takes practice. It's not easy to develop this. One of the things that, that I do and I feel, because I, I think that, we have to be careful with empathy as well, because if we're feeling intense sadness that the client's experiencing, and then that gets reflected back at the client, <laughs> then that's, that it goes beyond empathy to actually them having to cope with our emotions, you know? And so um, I remember, I, I'm by no means an expert in this, but I remember reading about Tonglin. I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a practice, a compassion practice. And what you do is you breathe in the pain and it could be the pain from another person. It can be the pain from your memories. It could be the pain from the, you know, the entire world, <laughs> but you breathe that in and you hold it and you breathe it in deeply. And then when you breathe out, you breathe out love and light. 
And so it's, it's a very painful process, actually. <laughs> I've, I've done it on my own and actually now talking about it, I'm like, I think I should start doing that again. But I've done that a few times where I'm in the client and they're just, when, I, where, when I'm with a client and they're in like incredible pain, is I'll just sit there and, and, and breathe it in and then send them as much love as I can. And of course, this is something that they may or may not be aware of, <laughs> probably not. But I do feel like it, it holds that space of compassion without me needing to even say a word. Mm, that's beautiful. Have you, have you, is, what is the name of it? I'm, I'm probably not pronouncing it correctly, but it's T O. I'll put it in the chat. It's T O N G L E N, and um, Pema Chuhema Chodron. I don't know if you're familiar with her. She she writes about it. So I'll see if I can find a reference and put it in here. Okay. Yeah, that's very powerful. Very very powerful. I remember in 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 some uh, in a session that I attended. Uh, uh, I've forgotten who it was, but uh, the facilitator had mentioned that uh, as a coach, if 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 you do feel like you always take on the energy of the client very, very easily, then try and imagine like a trans translucent uh, like a like a bubble around you, you know, and just know that there has to still be distance. You are, even though you are empathetic, you have that compassion, you are not that person. You know, so that, you know, that that kind of will help you to energetically, you know, create uh, that that gap. But I don't I don't know what your thoughts on this. So there are other practices, you know, like Tracy, you mentioned that could be of help. Because I think as a budding coach, like there are times when when I do experience that and uh, being in the moment sometimes feels like you have to take it on. Otherwise, you know, probably you aren't respecting uh, what the client is experiencing fully, you know, so. Mm -hmm. So I think, I mean, spiritual practices um, and uh, somatic practices, Tracy, you'd, you'd also know more about that. I think these relate there. Um, from for, for me, because I'm so stuck in my head of, you know, cognitive processing, for me, it's very much a cognitive process of um, understanding that another person's pain is their life journey. Okay, you can call it karma, whatever you can, but it's their life journey. And when a person goes through, and people are going to go through pain, whether we like it or not, okay? And if I, as the coach or as the friend, if I want to swoop in and rescue from them from the pain, I'm being disrespectful of their ability to learn and grow and find wisdom and resilience and character within that painful place. If I, as the coach or the friend, want to um, want to sit and, and, and I know how you feel, then I'm also being disrespectful because it's not my pain. And you, somebody else may go through a divorce and I may go through a divorce. They're two different divorces, okay? And there's two different pain experiences. So that's, I do it more from a, that's just my style is to do it from a cognitive perspective of absolute awareness that this, I am respectful. If I, I call it holding the sacred space for this person to be in that experience and navigate through that experience. But it's not for me to make them do it. And it's not for me to share my feelings and to take it on and make it about me. It's, a, it's their sacred space. Very powerful. So speaking about this, uh, would you say that there are any specific like process that we can follow uh, uh, keeping this in mind? Like one aspect of it definitely is, you know, whatever shows up for the client and being present. But, you know, like we have different models. Is there is there a model that you think specifically can be used uh, to help a client navigate grief. Tracy, I'm handing this one to you. <laughs> um, I don't know that I would say that there's a specific model other than what we've been talking about. So having the unconditional positive regard, having the compassion, understanding that compassion does not mean swooping into help. Um, compassion means being open to pain and, 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 and accepting it, having the desire to help. 
but helping is not helping the way we were, we think about it as like changing things. Helping in this case is holding space. Um, and so, and, and remembering our role as coaches. So, so I guess that would be my, I'm still navigating because I, I do, I have, I'm in the process of um, going through somatic experiencing education, but I'm still navigating how to, uh, okay, so, so maybe I'll bring this up. So in a coaching space, because I wouldn't maybe lead someone through anything because that's coming out of the role of coaching, right? But if somebody is, let's say, talking about their emotions, then I would, I, we, we would maybe invite some exploration of those things through metaphors, through other types of descriptions of like mm -hmm. heaviness, perhaps, or darkness, or um, the, you know, the temperature of it, or any, any number of those things, rather than like getting stuck in the story of why the emotion's there. Mm -hmm. um, and then for myself, um, when I need to resource, let's say in that space, then I'm able to kind of look at some of the things that you can do when someone has is dealing with like intense trauma, which is like feeling my feet on the ground, you know, um, being able to look at, let's say I'm feeling um, a lot of activation, kind of find another part of my body that feels differently. Um, and I've done that a little bit with clients as well, but it's only with permission and it's only with, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's only when it's kind of a part of their goal of how they want to feel <laughs> that we'll explore that. I wouldn't bring that in if it wasn't aligned with what they had said they wanted from the session. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I also think that um, that aspect of identity is really important there as well. So moving on from the actual the experiencing of it, because I mean that's what we want to do as coaches. We want to we want to connect the client to the whole of their being, not just and it's not just a feeling state. It's it's so much more than that. Um, but then also to um, support them to how do we how do you recreate that new identity? And there is a time for that when the client is ready. So what do you want to be saying? Um, a year from now, you know, doing visioning work about who am I, um, finding meaning and purpose and ritual and um, memorializing, those can also be very powerful moving forward strategies, um, you know, it's like, like, especially in, in traumatic experiences, tra traumatic um, grief, is how do you make meaning of a meaningless thing, because I think the human brain is too evolved to actually manage death particularly I think it's just too much for our brains to actually to navigate um but so but to, to actually make some kind of sense of it and I think ultimately that's where coaching really does work so recreating identity helping people make sense of it um and then also helping sometimes people even recreate their world around them sometimes it's actually you know you don't want to be with all the the parents in the play groups because you lost your child, for example. So, how do you actually re-navigate your social world, um, um, and and physical world, and you know? So, there's so many. Actually, it's not a model. You were actually, you know, I'm, I'm, I think I almost, I almost feel scared of the word model in terms of this kind of conversation. It feels too deep. But at the end of the day, we're going to use the grow model. What do you want? Where are you right now? What are the ways to get from here to there? We're going to um, use Lassie. We go, you know, we're going to listen. We're going to acknowledge. We're going to um, notice sensory experiences. You know, we're going to use all of that because that's how we coach. Um, um, yeah, sorry, I'm a bit, all, a little bit all over the place. So I think that there's many, there's tools, there's techniques, there's strategies, but mostly we just need to be coaches if the client is ready to be coached. Just thinking that, so when we say that we just we just need to be a coach uh, for our clients, what is it that they experience in that moment that leads to that shift to then say, "I want to move forward"? Can I can I use the neuroscience to to sort of support this? 
So really what we're doing is when a person is overwhelmed with emotion, okay, or trauma, or fear, or um, bewilderment, or whatever it is where there's an overwhelming emotional experience, really what happens um, from a, from a neurological point of view, their prefrontal cortex, their thinking, rationalizing, decision-making, planning, part of their brain is just offline. And what their limbic system, their emotional, their instinctive, their survival responses are all um, dominant. And often, like, like Tracy, you said, a client might suddenly in the middle of a session, two years after a loss or 10 years after a loss, experience that grief, and then they become, they just go into that limbic system. I think it's important that we, like Tracy said, we're able to sit present and be there with that experience with the client, not to say, no, 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 don't get emotional, let's think this through. However, it's also our role to ask reflective questions, compassionate questions, to get the client to be able to, so you are traumatized, you're feeling overwhelmed, okay, and metaphors, Tracy, for example, okay, what is one anchor that you can put in the ground? Okay, what is um, what what is something that you know that will support you? Um, what do you think this this person will say to you? What wisdom will they share with you? Helping them re-engage their thinking, processing, and planning kind of part of the part of their brain. So we can use, but we need to be very respectful in how we do it because if if I said to somebody who's just lost. Um, somebody close to them and I had to say to them so what do you think this is teaching you <laughs> that's just disrespectful and rude but if I had to say to somebody after they've been through it they processed it and now they want to navigate forward what is it that you needed to learn from this what is the wisdom you found in this what are the what is the resources that you discovered within yourself that you never knew that you had before so that's really what I'm doing is is shifting them from a reactive um uh, survival state into a processing, planning, and centered kind of maybe mindful state. Very, very, very interesting. It's an interesting, Colleen, because yesterday I was listening to a podcast and um, they were talking around trauma and um, how having so. I'm going to probably not say this properly, but <laughs> having a shift in mindset. So, so seeing things from a different perspective can actually send calming signals to our nervous system. Mm -hmm. And I thought that that was really, really interesting to, to explore because it's like, and of course, as we all know, that shift in perspective has to come from the client. That's not from us as a coach telling them <laughs> how they should look at things. And unfortunately, that's what a lot of people that are in bereavement and grieving have those yeah. well-meaning people that start telling them all the things that they need to do. But when exactly. that shift happens themselves, then that'll start repairing their nervous system as well. So it's it's just so interesting. <laughs> Mm, absolutely and and we can facilitate that shift through wise uh compassionate and reappraisal kinds of questions we can actually facilitate that space for them but like you say it has to come from within them and then we support them so what do you need to do with this because remember you can have this amazing insight this amazing new awareness suddenly you feel calm in a session and you walk out of there if you haven't got something to hardwire it something to anchor it, um, then, then um, that session might have just been a nice therapy session, as opposed to something that really empowers and helps a person move forward. What I'm also hearing is, I think with, with therapy, uh, like you said, uh, Dr. Colina, a while back, you go back into the past, even with with coaching with the client till they reach a point when that shift happens, they could still be in the past or experiencing that past right now, currently in the present, but feeling the emotions that they probably felt at that point. Yeah. And the acceptance part of it is probably when that shift happens for them. My question is, because we are, we are with people and we cannot really say that, you know, this might take you three months or four months, like, but, but how does, how, what does that cycle look like? 
because if as coaches while we are with uh, the client with their grief if 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 like how do we know that that's going it's going to come out from that place into acceptance and then moving forward how long does it usually take how 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 do we go about it you know there's so many contributing factors like the 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 closeness of the relationship like the historical factors of that um of relationship that may impact it, you know, feeling guilt or feeling resentment and those kind of things as well. Um, there's so many factors that I don't think we should actually put a time on it, although saying that, okay, um, certainly from a trauma response, when, when a person has experienced a traumatic event, um, they should actually be starting to find a way to be okay and to be present with what the experience was, not recovered, after about six weeks. After about six weeks, we say that they're moving into post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, with grief, again, very much dependent on the quality of the relationship, also the psychological equilibrium that the client was um, is in, um, their, resili their own personal resilience, the safety of the environment that they're engaged in. So there's so many factors. Um, but, you know, if a person two years later is still in the depth of um, the emotional experience where they just can't move forward, where they just can't see purpose and meaning, where they can't, there is no light, um, even a year later, there needs to have been some shifts, the person needs to have been, had gaps to breathe. So it's almost like there's a lightning and there's a lightning and there's a lightning and sometimes it drops again and then there's a lightning and there's, but you need to shish. You need to see movement, I guess. But there's, don't define how they should or when. I think you've got to be very, very careful of this. I just know if the person keeps going back, if the person is stuck, if the person, if there's too many complicated emotions that are connected to it, then it's not my role to um, support the person to navigate. Then I need to refer, um, certainly. I really appreciated what you said at the beginning of the session around acceptance. Also, it, it's not the final destination. It, it, it's something that we want to have all the way through. So when we're navigating the, like the intense guilt or the anger, or like I, the client, I have a client that lost someone close to her. And again, like I said, we were coaching on something else. And when I, um, asked her how she was, I, I had picked up the fact that like she was, very um disconnected you know but I didn't I, I didn't reflect that too we were just having a conversation and she said I I feel like I'm really disconnected you know and it was there was no sort of like how do you get connected like that that's not where she was at that moment mm -hmm. at that moment she actually felt like I can't make any decisions right now there's nothing I don't want to make any decisions right now I'm tired of people asking me for decisions so the last thing I was going to do is say yeah. What do you want to accomplish by the end of this session? Yes. We just had yeah. conversations around what, how, how was she resourcing during that time? And that ended up really being the focus of our session. So I guess what I'm saying is that like that acceptance can be that right now I'm not ready to connect to anyone or even myself, you know, and yes, that, and yes, she's seeing um, someone else for that. But I guess what I'm saying is that there's not like you said, Colleen, like, of course, if that's happening a year later or two years later, that's a different thing. But there's not a, a right or a wrong around. What am, what, am I, what, I, what am I trying to say? I guess in, 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 in this case, there was so much self-awareness around that that I didn't feel like it was like, a, you know, she's a lethargic state where like it was an alarming thing <laughs> that mm. that she, that this person wasn't connecting to anyone. It was just like, I need space. It's pathological. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 No, although I hate labels as well. So I don't even want to use that label. But there's a sense where this is absolutely not normal and not okay. Mm -hmm. And, and um, but you said it wasn't that, it was just part of her processing and you were what she needed you to be in, in that, at that time. And we can also ask our clients, what do you need from me? And also, I think what you were doing there as well is normalizing for them. That's also a very powerful tool, very powerful tool to be able to normalize. Doesn't, I don't care what my client is experiencing. I don't care if they, they're having hysterical giggles every night or they racked with guilt or resentment or anger. I don't, I don't, 
I mean, I do care, but you know what I'm saying? Whatever it is that they're feeling, it's normal. You can say that with absolute honesty. Whatever a person is experiencing, it's okay. It's what you're experiencing. And it's normal to have this absolute gamut of emotions and responses. Um, so I think that's kind of what you were doing as well, is just saying, be where you are, and I'll be here with you. You see, you, you, you said self-awareness, and, and that actually triggered a thought uh, in me, which was, let's say uh, I, I am going through a, a, a challenging phase, and I have become aware of this pattern where I see that after a while, I you know, like I rise and then I drop, and I have become aware of that pattern. So... I'm assuming I could be wrong, but that awareness could help me to navigate that grief, right? Because I know that previously I have moved, you know, two steps forward after that fall again. So there is a possibility of the same happening. Is that right? So can I answer from my own experience? Yeah. <laughs> um, I was quite young when I lost my, my husband and, um, when I look back at that time, I remember being, um, I remember being at the funeral and I remember like kind of looking at everything as if I was above it, you know? And there was so much, I felt like I think for about a year, I was watching myself as if I was in a movie. I was actually like imagining him watching me like I was in a movie. I had no awareness of that at the time. I, I was aware of it. Sorry, I was aware of it, but to me, there was nothing. There was no sense of this is how I'm avoiding coping with my my grief, mm. you know, and so now I look back at it mm. and having, of course, uh, you know, the awareness that has grown over the years and, and getting in touch with myself and learning about trauma and everything else. I, I know what that was, but I think that's what I think about when I think about self-awareness. Um, yeah. Whereas like, th like that client that I brought up actually was like, I know I'm disconnecting right now. You know, like, I, I don't think that I would have been able to say that at that point in time. And Tracy, do you think if, if, if you would, you would say to somebody, Look, I'm, I'm, just, I'm feeling like this, if you, although I'm not even sure that you were identifying what it is that you're experiencing, then the, you know, if somebody says, says like, you could say to your friend, um, that sense of disconnection, is part of the process or dissociating sounds like to me like you were dissociating to a certain extent dissociation is part of the experience that's where you are it's okay i'm here how can i support you kind of if that normalizing that naming like we don't have to be the experts but that's why i say it doesn't matter what a person is experiencing just be present with them that self-awareness thing I, I think maybe i'm going on a really random neural pathway here but we quite, you know, mindfulness is, is one of my subjects. Be very careful of mindfulness in the grief process because um, encouraging people to become mindful, that pain is sometimes too intense. It's too much for them to be present and they need to dissociate or they need to distract or they need to get be physical or whatever as opposed to present, experiencing, being with. Um, so we... You got to be careful. There's quite a lot of caution around using mindfulness as a tool in a grief process. Just to be aware of that. And maybe self awareness is not mindfulness, but maybe it's not necessarily wanting to bring awareness of self. Maybe that's what I'm saying. Yeah, because I guess that if in a point where being in ourselves is so incredibly painful then heightening the awareness of that yeah. um yeah. would be too much you know mm. but i think like you know had i and and this is where the self awareness thing comes in it's it's or not self awareness but just awareness in general or maybe it is about acceptance now that we talk about it because had somebody said what you said to me this is okay this is a part of the process I think that like because for me I was also 
I remember feeling so guilty that I wasn't crying, that I wasn't like grieving. You know what I mean? And I'm like, what is wrong with me? Like, I'm a cold mm-hmm. person. Like all of this stuff was coming up. Mm-hmm. I had no idea that that was part of coping. Mm-hmm. And so like, yeah, this normalization of like, it's okay to be angry. It's normal. It's okay to be guilty. It's normal. It's okay to be disassociating. Yeah. It's normal. You know, like, yeah. I, th- I feel like that can only help because what's worse is when we're going through an incredible amount of grief and then invalidating ourselves for the way we're feeling, we're just adding on another layer of grief. Absolutely. Mm. And not able then to process as well. Mm. Yeah. Just, just a, another thing that that's also coming to mind about, about that experiencing that pain. And sometimes it's not okay to actually be with that pain because the pain is too intense is that um, there's, there's, a, there's a thing called broken, um, broken heart syndrome. And basically broken heart syndrome is where people actually die from grief. <laughs> now, I don't want to be alarmist here, but, but the, what, what happens, if you think of the language we use, it broke my heart. My feelings are, are hurt. I feel, I'm in such pain. We use physical pain words to express emotional pain because it actually is mapped on each other in the brain. So social and emotional pain in the brain is actually mapped onto our physical pain network. So sometimes your body, um, Tracy, with, with somat- somat- somatic experiences, your body will actually be a complete reflection because it's phys- physical and, and emotional pain is completely correlated in the brain. So sometimes we need to support people to have strategies just to be, be with but not examine. Um, you know, that pain is sometimes just too much. Yeah. And that's where the somatic experiencing um, perspective is helpful because it's around, it's not around like diving into that pain. (laughs) It's around all these different techniques that you can use to kind of go in and out of the pain and bring your window of tolerance um, yes. like get into the window of tolerance so that you're not all the way out here. Um, yeah. And, that, and, and for that same reason that um, there's a lot of conversation around um, trauma informed meditation practices, like exactly what you were saying, Colleen. Um, and then also, I think it's important for all of us as coaches to be trauma informed. I, I think, I think it's key. Yeah. Absolutely. We did a uh, we did a session. Um, it's in the webinars on specifically on grief and trauma, and navigating that. So there's there is another session as well on that in the Kocharia um, bank of webinars. And I do believe that I, I th- it's a real thing. So and we're going to come across it at some stage. And also, if you're not comfortable, that's okay. You don't have to become comfortable with intense emotions. Um, some people want to be performance coaches and they want to help people think better, move through, set goals. And that's okay too. Be who you need to be and, and you will attract the clients to you that you um, need to attract to you as well. Mm. We are running out of time and I feel like there are still so many questions. Uh, but I think it's been really, really insightful uh, to hear from uh, you both, Dr. Colleen and Tracy. And thank you so much for sharing uh, experiences that you've also had. And uh, I think for myself as well, personally, as as someone who's getting into this journey, uh, it makes me feel like we are people and grief and such challenges will show up. No, but I think it's about being there, just being there as a person, you know, for for uh, your client. Uh, so I think it was absolutely wonderful having you both here. As we are closing out, uh, it would be lovely to hear from our participants if they want to use the chat box to just share maybe one takeaway, something that you know, it's going to stay with them after this session and from Dr. Colleen and Tracy, it would be nice to just hear just your closing thoughts, any any one, one thought that you'd like to leave all of us with. <laughs> I 
I always struggle with the part of what's the one thought that I want to leave everyone with. But <laughs> so I many. Guess, yeah, there's so many, but um, yeah, I, I guess just coming back to love and compassion, that's, that's really what I think that is the underlying need here. Um, and also having love for ourselves when, like you said, Colleen, sometimes this is outside of our scope and that's okay too, but kind of recognizing that. Um, but that's mm. my attempt at sharing a last thought. <laughs> yeah, I love Jennifer's comment that grief, grief is universal and uh, compassion is our superpower. There we go. Compassion yeah. is our superpower and compassion is not rescuing. Compassion is being with and supporting to empower, to move forward, supporting to move forward. Beautiful. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Colleen. Thank you, Tracy. And a big thank you to all our participants for joining in. Uh, we'll see you all next week again on Wednesday at the same time. Uh, you can follow us on our social media handles as well to stay updated on what we're bringing to you next. Uh, and have a wonderful in the morning, afternoon, or evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining in. Thank you, Kira. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.